Hello everyone and welcome to Southridge. If this is your first time joining with us in this format, we want to offer a few tips on how to make the most of this experience. Be sure to crank up the volume during the music and sing along. Don't worry, we can't hear you. Musicians, download the music chart below the video, grab your instrument and play along. For any kids participating with us, don't worry if you don't know the words or you can't read. Just sing, dance, or make music of your own. We're so happy when you join in with us. If English isn't your first language or you experience hearing challenges, we encourage you to turn on the closed captioning on this video or download the transcripts for the morning message. And be sure to download the Southridge app. This is the best way to stay connected and informed about everything that's going on here at Southridge. It's completely free and super easy to use. But for the next hour, I invite you to engage with this experience just as if you were with us, surrounded by a community of diverse, curious, open-minded, and inclusive people, all desiring to tap into the power and presence of God together as we worship, pray, listen, laugh, and grow. There might be some things we do or say today that really resonate with you, and that's great. There might also be some things that stretch and challenge you, and we think that's good too. Ultimately, we encourage you to engage openly, thoughtfully, honestly, and wholeheartedly, trusting that the God we're here to connect with is a God who is above all else, love. So as we begin our time together, wherever and whenever you are, whether this is your first time with us or you've been around forever, we hope that for the next hour, you feel like you're among friends. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here. We're creation, suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified The whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea to sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We hear Christ be magnified. Sing it out, Christ be magnified. Go. Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified, the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Finds its inmost melody And every human heart Its native cry Oh, and in one Enraptured hymn of praise We'll sing Christ Be magnified And oh, Christ be magnified strong and worship you and if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true and if the cross brings transformation 
confirmation that I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just the doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in your suffering, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, yeah, my heart will still be singing. Oh, my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let His praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. The altar of my life. Christ be magnified. Lord, you spent yourself in a wasteful way on your children, pouring out your life. You gave everything for your children. You. spend my life on you let me spend my soul in a wasteful way on you Jesus pouring out my love in a my day. 
the heart of God overflowing like a flood holding nothing back that I might know your love Freely give as I receive, holding nothing back that I might show your love for you. And loyalty, I will spend my life. I will spend my life. I will spend my life on you. Jesus said that I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will have much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus wants us to produce fruit, good fruit, like, like kindness, generosity, and faithfulness. Most of all, he wants us to love others as he has loved us. But we can't do that on our own, just as the branches must be connected to the vine before they can produce fruit, and you and I must stay connected to Jesus to love others as Jesus loved us. But we can't do it on our own, just as the branches must be connected to the vine before they can produce fruit. You and I must say, stay connected to Jesus to love others as Jesus loved us. We're glad you're here. <laughs> that sounded really weird. Yeah. You need to take a good look too. You ain't never gonna see another one like me. <laughs> we invite you. Nope. You forgot the whole line that you hated. The whole line. We are a diverse community of imperfect people. Who see the church as less of something to go to and more of a life to be lived and shared with others. We are continually growing in what it means to love one another, fighting for unity, rather than fighting over unnecessary arguments. We are living to serve this world in the way of Jesus, serving those in need and those on the margins, knowing that friendship truly makes the difference. So if you're coming with questions or curiosities, hurts or frustrations, joys or celebrations, wondering if the church can bring clarity or hope, or simply be a place to belong, we invite you to be at home with us. We invite you to explore with us, we invite you to grow with us. And we invite you to belong with us. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here. Hey there, my name is Jessica Reimer and I serve as the Director of Connection here at Southridge. We're so glad that you're participating with us and we hope that this has already been a meaningful time for you. So I'm here in our St. Catharines location, and if you've never joined us for one of our in-person gatherings at one of our physical Southridge locations, we would love to have you consider joining us in person when you feel ready and able. While we're so grateful to have this online platform to share in this experience from wherever and whenever we find ourselves, we love it even more when we can gather together as a community. In fact, if you do come out, please come say hi to me or one of our many welcoming volunteers, and we'd love to get a small gift into your hands, just as a way of showing our appreciation for taking the time to come and meet us in person. 
And as even more of an incentive, we actually have monthly welcome lunches for anyone who's looking to learn more about our community and wanting to connect with some folks over some delicious food. So just check out our events page on the website to see when an upcoming welcome lunch is happening and we'd love to meet you there. If for whatever reason you're not able to or not comfortable with joining us in person, please know that actually doesn't in any way exclude you from participating in community with us. If you need to touch base with a pastor for any reason, please simply fill out one of our connect cards. We can't wait to hear from you. For those of us who call this community home, one of the ways we practice togetherness and express our gratitude to God and generosity to others is by regular financial contributions. This is one of the ways we can invest our lives in what God is doing in and through our church family, making a difference by meeting needs among us, across our region, and around the world. All of our online given op giving options are available on our website, and so if you're able to give this week, we invite you to do so in a spirit of joy and generosity, and we thank you in advance for your faithfulness. So that's it from me. Now we're going to hear this week's talk together. And as we do, I invite you to remove as many distractions as possible and listen in to what God might want to be saying uniquely to you. Well, if you have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your personal device, I'd encourage you to turn with me to John chapter 15. Because today we're going to look at the final of the I am statements of Jesus uh, that we've been examining through this series. And personally, I feel like we're going to kind of end with a bang, not only because this particular I am statement is probably the easiest to understand, especially if you grew up or live in the Niagara region, but because as we understand it more fully, I believe that appreciating this I am statement of Jesus has the potential to unlock a greater and fuller and deeper experience of all of the other I am statements that we've looked at throughout this series. So let's not waste any time. We'll dive right in and hear what Jesus declares about himself in John 15, beginning in verse 1. He says this. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, most likely here, Jesus was walking down the road with his disciples and stumbled on an actual vineyard that he most probably used as kind of a visual by the way to serve as an object lesson for how he wanted to relate to his followers. And I think for those of us growing up in the Niagara region, especially for those of us maybe from Niagara-on-the-Lake or the Vineland-Lincoln areas, we can have a special, maybe an automatic appreciation for what Jesus was getting at because we're familiar with the beauty and the lushness and the abundance and the vitality of a vineyard, especially in harvest season. And this picture that Jesus is painting at its core is of Jesus as what he describes as the true vine, serving as the life source for all of that abundance and vitality among his people. Now, on top of that, similar to the other I am statements that we've looked at in this series, there's also some Old Testament prophetic punch to Jesus' declaration here. And uh, there were several sightings in the Old Testament where God, through certain prophets, kind of imaged his people in terms of a grapevine or in terms of a, a vineyard. I'll give you an example here in Isaiah chapter 5, where God, through the prophet Isaiah, says, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. We see in images like that, that Isaiah is using as he describes the predicted, promised Jewish Messiah, the savior of the world to be sent from God, that when that happens, God is going to relate to his people in, you know, kind of like a vineyard with that lush vitality and life and abundance. 
And so here, Jesus isn't just declaring himself as the true vine and that life source. He's also in declaring the I am of the true vine, tapping into that Old Testament kind of covenant promise name of God in I am and declaring that he once again is that covenant promise fulfilled. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus is predicting that he would be the great I am that fulfills that name of God from the Old Testament and can relate in this case to his would-be followers like a true vine. And I hope that the combination of that covenant fulfillment and just the image of the vine with the branches can really compel us to appreciate just how differentiated the invitation of Jesus actually is from every other world religion. In fact, from religion at all. And we've talked before about the fact that religion is really a a, a set of like activities or behaviors or engagements that people do essentially for God. You stand, you sit, you kneel, you pray, you give, you, you... Uh, you know, you take time off, you you Sabbath, you rest. All those activities are things that, that people from a religious mentality will do for God or to please God or to feel right with God or to somehow feel like they've secured their afterlife. And, you know, from that perspective, Jesus is completely reframing things here, both as the covenant promise fulfilled through his death and resurrection and in this image of a vine providing life to the branches. Jesus is not describing things that people can do for him. Jesus is describing what he wants to do for people in providing a resource in people and through people where Jesus becomes the very empowerment of the life he invites people into. That's fundamentally different than religion altogether. God doesn't just invite us into a way of life and leave us to our own resources. No, Jesus, through his death and resurrection, wants to empower us and actually live in and through us the very life that he invites us into. And so the question today is, you know, how practically can we experience that quality of life for ourselves? And I think what Jesus does is provides a little more detail to the framework of this picture and this object lesson of this vineyard that we can learn from today. So let's read on in verse 5 where Jesus says this. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. For us to fully understand this final I am statement of Jesus, we've got to appreciate the four ingredients in this image or metaphor that Jesus refers to. There's a vine, there's branches, there's fruit, and there's a gardener. So first of all, from the perspective of the vine, we've already talked about that a little bit. That's Jesus identifying himself as the very life source for the branches to generate fruit. That again, unlike the way religion works, rather than something people do for God, Jesus is envisioning something that he wants to do for and in and through people as being the very risen life that empowers the life he's inviting people into. And so the response to people who in this metaphor are the branches isn't to go and do a whole bunch of things on our own resources, but rather, Jesus says, to simply remain. That's the instruction that he gives the branches, to remain in him. Some translations use the word abide, which literally means to take up home or take up residence in. And it refers to kind of a disposition or an attitude of heart that is on the one hand connected and on the other hand reliant. 
That's what a branch that's, that's abiding in or remaining in the vine does. It's connected to and reliant on the resources that the vine provides. Which if that happens, that can yield the third piece and that's the fruit. And it shouldn't surprise us that the fruit Jesus is referring to, like the impact of every one of the other I am statements that we've studied, would look like a cross-carrying, self-sacrificing, others-oriented love. Jesus refers to that in John chapter 15 and verse 9. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now, he says, remain in my love. Shouldn't surprise us when, you know, fruit is just the outward visible manifestation of the life source itself. And so any fruit from being connected and reliant on Jesus would look something like what love looks like because he came to embody love himself. And if we actually want a, a further, kind of more robust picture of that, we can fast forward to the New Testament where the Apostle Paul describes the fruit of the living Spirit of God at work in people's lives in greater detail in Galatians 5. He says there, the fruit of the Spirit is love, but it's also joy and peace and forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Rather than just providing us a vision of the fruit of a life with Jesus being defined by some nebulous kind of hippie love, both Jesus and the Apostle Paul provide some weight, some, some texture to it in the practicalities of what love looks like in the context of human relationships. It's love in all of these practical expressions. And then finally, we need to appreciate the role of the gardener. That as this vine's growing, it can grow wild or naturally, or it can be tended to by a gardener whose responsibility is to get rid of unwanted growth in order for the wanted fruit to be nourished the best. That's why Jesus says the gardener prunes the vine and prunes the branches for greater fruitfulness. That's the purpose or role of the gardener. Now, before we put all those four together, I just want to make a comment from personal experience. You may be surprised to learn that I have experience in the grape growing world, but it was actually uh, that very reason that I ended up being part of this church back when I was a 10 year old kid, because my mom, my mom and dad uh, sold their house in the north end of St. Catharines, and we moved out into the west end of kind of rural St. Catharines because they bought a 13 acre hobby grape farm. Well, what that meant soon after was that their kids, especially their firstborn son, inherited some of the farm work, some of the jobs of growing these grapes, which, to be clear, was not a hobby for me. And uh, one of the roles that I particularly despised was kind of in later spring, early summer. It was a job called suckering the grapes. You ever heard of suckering the grapes? Do you know what a sucker is in grape terms? As a kid, I used to think a sucker was a kid whose parents made them do farm work, but I learned that technically a sucker, we've got an image here you can look at, a sucker was a shoot that grew out of the bottom of the grapevine. So unlike pruning, that kind of prune back the branches that you then later tied to the, to the metal wires, later in the spring, suckers grew out of the base of the vine. And so it was a brutal job to have to cut back or brush away these suckers. You'd bend down and kind of brush them away or cut them back, then stand back up, move on to the next plant, bend down, step back up, and do that again and again and again times 13 acres of work. Well, in that experience, two things that I took away. One was just an appreciation for how rapidly growth happens if you're actually connected to that vine. Because if you didn't get at those suckers at just the right time, if you got out there, you know, a couple weeks late, maybe it was rainy, muddy, whatever, you didn't want to go out, go out and do that work. If you didn't get out there in the right time, those suckers were like twice as thick and four times as long. And they took a lot more work to get rid of than if you caught them early and could just kind of quickly brush them away. 
The other thing that it taught me was just how much it was important to cut back unnecessary growth in order for the real growth and the real fruit to be optimized and just how important that work was, not just in pruning, but in the process of suckering the grapevines as well. So with that insider knowledge, uh, I would share today what I believe are the two main takeaways for us to experience the most of the image Jesus is casting here and the impact of it in our lives. The first, as per Jesus' kind of direct instructions in the text, is for followers of his to stay connected to the vine. If we want to experience this I am of Jesus, we've got to learn in increasing ways to stay connected to the vine. That's what Jesus means when he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. See, the practical responses to Jesus, the practical engagements of a follower of Jesus are not religious activities, meaning things that we just do for God, but they're engagements and activities with the purpose of reorienting our minds and the attitudes of our hearts back into that abiding place with Jesus, back into that posture of connection and reliance, connection and reliance. Around here, that's what we mean when we encourage the engagement in what we call spiritual practices. You know, things like Bible reading and prayer and silence and solitude and fasting and Sabbath keeping and hospitality and so many more expressions of faith. We describe these and we encourage these around here, again, not to do things for God, but because every time we engage in those practices, it can serve to recenter our hearts and reorient our attitude and our minds into that abiding, remaining place of connection and reliance on Jesus, where instead we can allow his life to be lived in and through ours. The other takeaway might not be as obvious, but from my perspective, it might even be more significant. And that isn't just about staying connected to the vine, but actually staying committed to the vision that Jesus casts here. Because as Jesus provides this object lesson to his original followers and to us today, he provides us a very specific kind of configuration of these different ingredients that, I don't know about you, but if I'm honest with myself, I can tend to reconfigure my own way. You know, if I'm honest with myself and I think about the, the vine and the branches and the fruit and the gardener, I can oftentimes position myself as the vine because my attitude of heart orients my entire world around me. And when it comes to the branches, I can actually treat Jesus as one of those branches. Sure, Jesus is one of those things that I'm trusting in, but I can trust in a lot of other things. I can trust in financial stability. I can trust in relationships. I can trust in a, a, a job. I, I can trust in my own future plans. I can trust in you know, my, my health or physical exercise. And you know, Jesus can be one of those many branches that I trust in to bear the fruit that I'm interested in bearing, where my definition of fruit or my definition of a successful or a thriving life might include very different things like the respect or admiration of people or, you know, stable, satisfying work or, you know, a, a long life physically and, you know, being healthy and experiencing financial stability or security or enjoying fun with my friends or, you know, satisfying, enjoyable vacations or whatever that package is. I can have my own definition of fruit which makes me often want to relate to God as the gardener way more as a fertilizer of that for me. And I can approach God for his blessing to fertilize the fruit that I want, trusting in Jesus as one of the many things that I trust in because I'm centering things on myself as the vine. And the big question for me, and I'm sure for many of us today, is Will we actually orient our lives around the various roles in the picture that Jesus paints? 
Will we prioritize the fruit of his character transformation above all of our other earthly or societally, you know, metrics or, or definitions of success? Will we rely exclusively and learn in ever-increasing ways to adopt that posture of abiding and of remaining in him rather than trusting in him plus a whole bunch of other things to boot? And most importantly, will we allow God to play the role of gardener and actually tend to our lives, pruning away things that get in the way of love flowing? Will I look to God just to bless me? Or will I look to God to prune me and to prune away whatever pride or ego or defensiveness or unwillingness, whatever status seeking, whatever privilege or power I might cling to that gets in the way of him allowing the vibrancy and abundance of his life and love to flow more fully and freely through me? See, if we can face those questions today, captivated by the vision that Jesus casts today, I think that not only can we experience the fullness of Jesus as the I am the true vine, but we can actually unlock his activity to greater degrees in a way that unlocks all of the other I am's that we've looked at. We can experience more of the I am provider of Jesus as the bread of life, more of the I am guidance of Jesus as the light of the world, more of the I am restoration of Jesus as the resurrection and the life, more of the I am comfort in Jesus as the good shepherd, more of the I am way of life as he describes himself as the way and the truth and the life, if in fact we can embrace Jesus and the vision he casts as the I am of the true vine and abide in him as branches to bear the fruit that he desires as God the gardener prunes away everything that gets in the way of love. And so, as an initial practical response, we're gonna to participate together now in a spiritual practice that hopefully can lead us in that direction. The spiritual practice is called communion. Uh, we often refer to it as the Lord's Supper because it's modeled after the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples before he gave his life up for the sin of you and me. Jesus took a piece of bread and took a glass of wine and he ate and he drank them and he said to do this, he said, in remembrance of him which is interesting because it kind of presupposes that Jesus already knows that his followers are going to be forgetful of him and need their minds and their attitudes of heart reoriented and recentered on him. That's the purpose of the spiritual practice of communion, to do this in remembrance of him. And as we take the piece of bread, which is gluten-free in our case, and eat it resembling, as Jesus said, his body broken for us, we can remind ourselves of the covenant-fulfilling, sacrificial death and resurrection that makes his life available today to live in and through us in the very life he invites us into. And we can take that bread with gratitude and thankfulness. And then we can take the cup, which instead of wine is alcohol-free grape juice in our context. And as we do, we can celebrate the image that Jesus describes as representative of the new covenant or the new relationship that he desires to have with people. Not of religion and rule keeping and trying and doing all kinds of things for God, but rather of reorienting our attitude of heart to an abiding place of being connected to and reliant on the very resource that Jesus wants to provide. As we participate in communion together, I hope that this spiritual practice can serve to stimulate that abiding posture so that we not only experience Jesus as the true vine resourcing our lives, but we can unlock Jesus as the great I am and experience all of his activity in and among us as he builds and grows and flourishes his life and love among us together. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we're grateful now that as a community, we can participate in this spiritual practice that I hope will remind us of you, that will remind us of your body broken for us and your blood shed for us, that made your life available to be received and to resource us for everything that you invite us into. And I pray that we'd be captivated by that. 
And in response, I pray that we would give our hearts back to you, not in a whole bunch of activity on our own, but in reliance through connection on you, that you would recenter our hearts around abiding in you so that more and more, not just in one-off moments, but moment by moment, day by day, in the practicality of our every day, we can become better at abiding and remaining in you so you can bear the much fruit in and through us that shows us to be your disciples. Thanks for what you want to do. We look forward to watching you work, and we give you all the credit for it. We love you, Jesus. In your name, amen. We're going to take a moment now to join our hearts together around the table of the Lord's Supper, or communion. If you haven't had a chance to grab something, a piece of bread, a cracker, some juice or water, you can collect those now as you prepare to celebrate with whoever is with you and across the distance with the rest of the church family. It's through communion that we get to celebrate the incredible, barrier-breaking, darkness-shattering, eternal circle-widening gift of love offered up by Jesus on the cross. His broken body, represented by the bread, and his blood poured out in love, represented by the juice. As we engage in this practice together, receiving these elements right into our own bodies, we choose to consciously remember the new life that now flows through our veins by His Spirit, and the new love that now flows in the space between us as siblings in Christ, creating unity in spirit. We often refer to this as coming to the family table together, and whether you are physically alone or with others this morning, we want you to know in the deepest reality that in spirit, in taking part in this practice, we are all together at the family table. Each of us has been joyfully invited right into the center of Jesus' intimate and wide-open circle. So at any point during the next song, whenever you are ready, receive the bread and juice. Thank you, Jesus, for your body, broken in order to make us whole. And thank you for your blood poured out in love. Transform us by its power. From the inside out, we pray. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus For my life is wholly bound to Him how strange and divine I can sing All is mine, yet not I But through Christ in me The night is dark But I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior, He will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing For in my need His power is displayed and To this I hold My shepherd will defend me Through the deepest valley He will lead Oh, the night has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me and no fate 
I dread I know I am forgiven The future sure The price it has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my pardon And he was raised To overthrow the grave To this I can sing I am free yet not I but through Christ in me with every breath I long to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus all the glory to him when the race is complete and still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me to this I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to Complete, still my lips shall repeat it, not I, but through Christ in me. Oh, when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat it, not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. We are a community of imperfect people who desire to put into practice the good news that we preach. Our faith is not about an hour of watching or attending. It's about a lifestyle of full devotion to Christ. Not just a something to believe, but someone to follow. We don't want to talk a good game on Sunday, only to remain unaffected or ineffective the rest of the week. So while we gather each week to sing, pray, listen, and learn. We know that an hour a week will never produce the life change that we so desperately need. It requires a daily investment of time and training. It takes practice. And practice. And more practice. And when we mess up, we forgive ourselves and each other. Then help each other get up and keep practicing. As we go now into the rest of our week, May we not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. May the Spirit of God fill us and make us kind and compassionate. Honest and humble. Generous and hospitable. Those who repay evil with good. Respond to injustice with action, overcoming despair with hope. Let us be known not by what we are against, but by what and who we are for. And most of all, let us love one another, because God is love. It's been good to be together, but now it's time for us to go. In the name of the Father, who loves us unconditionally. In the name of the Son, who restores our true humanity. And in the name of the Spirit, who empowers us to live life to the full. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. 
We hope that you felt inspired and challenged by our time together. Now, we know that what we've heard today to become reality in our daily lives, it's going to take more than this one hour a week we spend together. It requires a moment by moment, seven days a week commitment to practicing the way of peace and the way of Jesus. That's why we provide a host of ways to continue to lean into God's presence while we're away from each other. As always, you can click the daily practices button below the player for daily spiritual exercises to continue to develop the muscles we've started building today. If it helps, you can also opt into the spiritual practices notification as you, on our app to get those helpful reminders every morning as you start your day. And if you'd like a more personal conversation with someone about anything that's going on in your life, we invite you to reach out to our location pastors who will follow up with you privately. Simply fill out our connect card, which you can find on our website or our app. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us and have a great week.